Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Claire Lindsay. I'm the Deputy Director of the Oxford Centre for Animal Ethics and today I'd like to talk to you about animal theology. 25 years on, its challenge and its promise. Firstly, thank you so much to the Vegan Church for having me to talk to you all. Um, it's a real honour and a privilege to get to talk about animal theology and uh, I hope this ignites some debate and um, discussion in uh, your own theological circles. So, animal theology. What I'd like to cover today is what it is, um, how it challenges our ideas about animals, and how it lays the foundation for a more inclusive idea of Christian ideas about creation. Um, so, Animal Theology. Uh, it was um, published by my father, Andrew Lindsay, in 1994. Um, it remains as challenging then as it is now. Um, he doesn't offer a concise definition of what animal theology is, um, but what it, I like to define it as an attempt to view the Christian tradition through an animal-friendly lens, um, but while retaining a critical approach to tradition with regards to its views on animals. Um, it's really about um, moral concern for animals within the Christian tradition. Animal theology is thus involved, like feminist theology, in a process of looking again at the Christian tradition to reclaim and rebuild our ideas and insights concerning our relationship with animals. Now many of you might be asking, why? Why theology? Why not philosophy? Why not science? Well, the answer is, Theology is crucial for animals because it has been and still is central to our debate about animals, to the ideas, um, sometimes ideas that people don't even know they have about animals are theologically grounded. Um, so the central ideas that influence our attitudes and behaviour towards animals often have a theological, a theological component. If we ask ourselves, why do animals have such a low status? The answer is because our controlling ideas about animals are predominantly negative. Now, theology has had a key role, and some might say still does have, in legitimising, in um, originating and certainly in propagating negative ideas about animals. So, I'd like to begin by looking at that negative tradition. The negative tradition on animals. Animals have no mind, no reason, no soul, no sentience, no rights, and thus no status. I'm going to take each one in turn. No mind or reason. This idea really entered the Christian tradition through St Thomas Aquinas, um, who was borrowing heavily from the philosopher Aristotle. He says, Dumb animals and plants are devoid of the life of reason, whereby to set themselves in motion they are moved, as it were, by a kind of natural impulse, a sign of which is that they are naturally enslaved and accommodated to the uses of others. So reason is really what's key here. Reason is what separates us from the animals, or at least that's what Aquinas thought. And re because they don't have reason, um, they are only moved by instinct, a kind of natural impulse. And because they're only moved by instinct, um, they are naturally slaves. Because they don't have reason, they're naturally slaves. Now see the circular logic of the argument, how do we know that they are naturally slaves because we can enslave them. And so that this idea of rationality grounds the whole view um, that's come into the Western tradition of how we treat animals. No soul. Well, 
you often hear Christians say, oh, we don't have to treat animals uh, appropriately because they don't have souls. This is very common um, in a Latin American perspective where um, Catholicism is very strong. The idea that animals have souls, um, don't have souls, and we have souls, and that makes us superior to them. But actually, the Catholic tradition has never denied that animals have souls. There are simply different kinds of souls. So, vegetative souls for vegetables, animated, an animated souls for animals, and rational souls for humans. But it is only the rational souls that are immortal. And so, rationality, again, here is key. Humans are more important because they have rational and immortal souls, whereas animals um, only have animate souls um, and are not immortal. Um, you see, the argument builds upon itself. So from the idea that animals don't have a mind, don't have reason, don't have souls, you get the idea that animals are different from us. Um, and perhaps maybe they feel differently from us. And so from that came the idea um, that animals um, have no sentience and they have no feeling. Um, this is classically expressed by the philosopher René Descartes. He says, they, that is animals, act naturally and mechanically like a clock. And he writes, there is no prejudice to which we are more accustomed from our earliest years than the belief that done animals think. Now, some might say that this was just a philosophical perspective for Descartes and that actually he didn't really believe that animals didn't feel, but actually his followers, the Port Royalists, certainly did believe that animals didn't feel and um, they experimented on animals and uh, they viewed their screams as a uh, um, just the kind of squeaky noises that machines make, um, as opposed to um, actual indications of suffering. No rights. Now this is a perspective um, that's um, been propagated in the theological tradition up until the 1960s. So the Dictionary of Moral Theology, published in 1962, writes, zoophilists, that is animal lovers, often lose sight of the end for which animals, irrational creatures, were created by God, for the service and use of man. In fact, Catholic moral doctrine teaches that animals have no rights on the part of man. So again, here, rationality is key. Animals are irrational creatures, and they are here, they are made for the service and use of man. In fact, Catholic moral doctrine says that they have no rights towards animals, um, no duties whatsoever, um, not even a duty of kindness, because of course, philosophically, the ideas of duties and rights are often paired together. No status. So you see how the argument has progressed. No mind, no reason, no soul, no sentience, no rights, and of course, because they have no rights, no status. And this is expressed by um, the moral theologian Joseph Rickaby in his book Moral Philosophy. He writes, um, brute beasts, having not understanding, hence reason again, and therefore not being persons, cannot have any rights. We have no duties of charity, nor duties of any kind to the lower animals, as neither to sticks nor stones. So animals are the same as, they're not even as sensitive as plants, they are the same as sticks and stones, and we have no duties, no duties of charity, no duties of kindness um, towards animals whatsoever. And so this is the very strong negative version of the um, tradition on animals in uh, Catholic moral theology. Now you might say, um, 
well, this is just a Catholic perspective, Claire. What about other traditions? Well, the truth is, is that um, the position on animals has rarely been questioned by uh, theologians in other traditions. Um, Calvin, Zwingli, um, Luther, they all accepted the Catholic doctrine on animals. Um, so what has this led to? The practical answer on what this has led to, there are, it's led to things both theoretically and practically in implications for animals. Um, three, three results um, generally of um, uh, this negative tra tradition are instrumentalism, uh, dualism and humanism. Let me answer them one on by one. Instrumentalism. This is the idea that animals are simply here for our use. You'll hear this all the time. It is the might equals right perspective. We can use animals as we wish and so um, we have the right to. Uh, you can see this in both Aristotle, Augustine and Aquinas again. Aristotle says since nature makes nothing without some end in view, nothing to no purpose, it must be that nature has made them, that is animals and plants, for the sake of man. So animals and plants are simply here for our use. Augustine again says, if when we say thou shalt not kill, we do not understand this of plants since they have no sensation nor of irrational animals, since they are disassociated from us by their want of reason, and are therefore, by the just appointment of the Creator, subjected to us to kill or keep alive for our own uses. So it is divinely ordained. What in Aristotle was simply just the way it was, the way nature made it. In Augustine and in Aquinas, it is divinely ordained that animals are simply here for human use. This is um, uh, uh, echoed in Aquinas, who says, by divine providence, they are intended for man's use according to the order of nature. Hence, it is not wrong for man to make use of them either by killing or in any other way whatever. Aquinas places absolutely no limits on the use of animals by man except that that which would erode human, humanity's own moral fibre. That's the only limitation. They, they acknowledge um, within the Catholic tradition that animals, that treating animals badly might be bad for humans. And so um, we should be careful of that. But there is no reason to uh, treat them badly, for the, uh, treat them well or badly uh, for their own sake. Dualism. This is the view that animals are just animals. Um, we see this in the distinctions we make between human and animals all the time. Humans are made of flesh, spirit, animals are made of flesh. Uh, humans are made of mind, animals are made of matter. Humans are persons, animals are just things. Humans have souls, animals don't have souls. Of course, you now know that that's not right, but nonetheless that distinction is often drawn. And you see that in the language that we use about animals too. Brutes, beasts, irrational, dumb. The language and the distinctions we make are always in favour of humans being superior to animals. Humanism. Only humans matter. Now, you might say, Claire, this is the highest form of idolatry, that only humans matter, and yet it is repeated throughout the Christian tradition. Hans Kung, celebrated Christian theologian, says, God wills nothing but man's advantage, man's true greatness and his ultimate dignity. This is then, this then is God's will, man's well-being. That's all God wants. Karl Barth says, Man is the measure of all things because God became man. And this is echoed in the Catholic Catechism as recently as 1994. God willed creation as a gift addressed to man, an inheritance 
destined for and entrusted to him. So, what's the result of this negative tradition? Well, there are theoretical results and practical results. Theoretical. It is the deification of the human species, the more or less absolute identification of God's will with humanity. Of course, this is a form of idolatry, the assumption that God is wholly or chiefly concerned with the welfare of the human species to the exclusion of the rest of creation. But it has very clear practical implications as well, and that is essentially that animals don't matter. They don't matter morally because they don't matter theologically. If God doesn't care for animals, why should we? And you see this a lot in the Christian church's general indifference to the issues of animal cruelty, abuse and exploitation. To name just a few examples, uh, Pope Pius IX um, forbid the opening of a society for the protection of cruelty to animals in Rome. He didn't even believe that there should be such a thing in Rome. And you can see it in the widespread toleration of bullfighting, whaling, hair coursing, sealing, sport hunting in Catholic countries. Now you might say to me, Claire, can Christianity be redeemed in this sense? Or is it irredeemably speciesist? Are Christian doctrines actually capable of legitimate theological adaptation? Or are we so steeped in anthropocentrism that actually Christianity is kind of stuck and uh, we can't get past it? Now you might be surprised to know that actually that isn't my perspective. I think Christianity is not um, irredeemably speciesist. In fact, there are grounds within the tradition, some might say even more authentic voices, um, that point to a different conception of creation, a more animal inclusive view of the world. To look at that, let's take a look at the um, uh, some key Christian ideas about animals and explore them. Let's begin with dominion. Dominion um, was given in Genesis 1 and is often used to bolster the might equals right perspective. God gave us dominion over the world so we can use the world and animals as we wish. Um, however, if you return to the original text, um, just before just after dominion is given, we're also given a vegan diet. He gives you the plants and the trees to eat. Um, now, what does this mean um, contextually? Well, if you look at it, um, as many biblical studies um, scholars have, they agree that the giving of dominion and the giving of um, the vegan diet actually go hand in hand together. And as my father is often fond of saying, um, herb eating dominion is hardly a license for tyranny. So what does that mean? What does dominion actually mean um, in the context of um, having a vegan diet? Well, dominion can be interpreted many ways. And one of those ways is in terms of responsibility for creation. It, in fact, one can look at it as an imperative to care for creation as God's deputies on earth. With the giving of dominion, we're also given the image of God, the Imago Dei. Now, this is also an argument that's often used to underline human supremacy. Animals are not made in the image of God like humans, and so we can do as we want with them. But again, you have to look at the text and the dominion, the image and the vegan diet all go together, texturally speaking. And so you have to ask yourselves, in the image of what kind of God are we made? We're made in the image of a God who created the earth, the heavens and the earth, 
who created the animals, who created humans, and has instilled in us um, the position to love and care for the God's creation. Indeed, to till and serve the earth. So the image of God is not a license to do as we wish with to do with creation as we wish. Another argument that's often drawn upon is the idea of covenant. Um, that humans have a special covenant with God um, that animals don't have. Um, it's used as an idea to suggest that humans are specially elect and specially important within creation. Now, um, what people often um, miss in the giving of the covenant is that it's given in Genesis 9. After God has said, I am sorry that I have made them, referring to humanity. The covenant is not between um, it's not between God and humans, rather it's between God and the rest of the world. Um, it is God's promise to never destroy the earth as God did um, in the flood. What's more, we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to have a special relationship with God? What does it mean to be God's, um, to be God's um, specially chosen in creation? Well, you can interpret that as a license to do what you like, or you can interpret that as a special role of responsibility within creation, that actually we are here to care and serve for the world. Unlike some theologians and um, some philosophers, I'm not necessarily um, focused on the idea that we should um, suggest that humans and animals are equal or morally um, similar. Rather, um, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to deny human superiority. I think humans are superior in the sense that they have morality, they have ethics, they have the ability to make moral decision-making skills. And from that, um, we have the ability to behave better, to do better for animals and to do better for creation. Incarnation. This is often viewed um, theologically as God's great yes to humankind. That by taking on human, um, by taking on humanity, God said yes to humans in a way he didn't say yes to the rest of creation. However, the particularity of the incarnation is a problem, um, theologically speaking, because if you stress too much the taking on of the white male Jesus in particular, you can very easily make um, the incarnation only important for men, or indeed only important for white men, um, as uh, some womenist theologians uh, would uh, argue. Instead, you can see the incarnation as a yes to fleshly existence. God takes upon himself in Jesus creaturely existence and he becomes literally enfleshed. And of course, humans are not the only beings to have flesh. And so in the incarnation, we, he assumes creatureliness, fleshliness, and in so doing, God says yes, not just to humanity, but to all enfleshed creation, including animals. The spirit. It's often key, um, it's often said that the Holy Spirit is infused within the individual human soul, that it's what gives the human soul animation and life, and it is what connects humanity to God. However, that is just one way of looking at uh, the spirit. Indeed, it, um, if you look biblically, um, the spirit is sent out throughout creation and indwells in all creation, not just humanity. Redemption. 
again, following on from the incarnation, there is the idea that it is human salvation, that humans are saved on the cross, that this is a salvific moment, not just for the world, but only for humanity. But if you look again more closely at the biblical witness, you'll see in Ephesians and Colossians that all things are taken up in Christ, that actually it is the world that is redeemed and animals within it. So the view that humans are uniquely special within creation is both validated and not validated um, by the Christian tradition. It, they, humans are special within Christianity, but it has a particular meaning, and that meaning is one of responsibility. If you look again at the um, incarnation, what you have there is an image of ultimate power, divine power, expressing itself as service. Lordship expressed as service. So humanity's role then is not as the master species to rule over creation, but rather as the servant species to be here to take moral responsibility for the world and to lead the way in caring for the world. And that is why animal theology is so important for the Christian community because now more than ever creation needs us to take a leading role in helping animals and the environment and thinking of others before ourselves. And in this case animal and non-animal um, others not just human animal others. So you might say Claire this is all very nice, um, but that's just a sub-tradition. That isn't an authentic voice within the Christian tradition, and, um, and there's no real indication that Christianity can change, that it could embrace a different side of its traditions. Well, I would say that there are signs that things are changing. There are sub-traditions. Um, St. Francis is often... Um, lauded as the great example of um, uh, in the Christian tradition of people who really communed and saw um, as a person who really saw animals and creation as important. Um, so it's not um, just a dominant tradition and it's not just quiet voices, they are popular voices too um, that you can appeal to of saints. There's a, St. Francis is one of many saints who cared for animals. Um, but the question of whether theology can change, of whether, um, of whether Christianity can change, is still a very real one. Um, and it brings to mind a story that my father likes to tell of um, Frederick Temple and his son William Temple, both of whom went on to be archbishops of England. Um, when uh, William was a child, he asked his father, um, if philosophers are so great, why don't they rule the world? And his father said, they do, just 500 years later. Ideas, you see, can change the world, but it is a slow change. And changing the world for animals involves changing our ideas about animals. It involves embracing a different way of looking at our relationship to creation. That is a slow change, but it is possible, and we are seeing signs of that. For example, um, the latest Pope, Pope Francis, is a um, Latin American Pope concerned with the poor and the environment. And this environmental concern um, has uh, produced an encyclical called Laudito Se on concern and care for our common home. That is the earth. In, it, in which he mentions animals. He says they have value in and of themselves they give glory to God, and that they are, um, and that they are, should, that they are part of our family. Now, does that go as far as I would like it to? 
Probably not. But there are signs of profound change. And it, and I think if I read you um, part of the opening lines to Laudito Se, um, that will indicate the change in language and the change in perspective that's happening right now within the Catholic tradition. We have come to see ourselves uh, um, as her, that is the earth's, lord and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. We have no right to do so, he goes on to say. The idea that humans are simply allowed to use the earth in, in whatever way they want to is not theologically sustainable, nor is it... Um, nor is that biblically valid. He, um, he cites a great deal, many people within the tradition, um, but his concern for the environment and concern for the earth are paramount, not least of all because how we treat the earth affects how the poor and everybody else around us. Now, is this far enough? Does he say enough on animals? No, he doesn't. Um, would I like him to have said more against cruelty um, or against sport hunting or make, made a moral stand on a variety of different animal issues? Um, no, he doesn't. But theology is an ever-changing subject and um, the fact that this movement has been made towards changing our relationship with the environment and embracing a different way of seeing the world is incredibly positive. And it seems that we are now in a moment where we are moving towards care for all of our common home and animals who live within it. Um, well, I hope that um, this has been helpful and I'd like to thank Anya and Sandra and Nienka um, for inviting me to speak to you all. And um, I hope that uh, this has been thought provoking and interesting for you. Thank you.